Hey y'all, welcome back to the life of Pylea. I'm Pylea. Today we're doing, it's February 1st, the day I'm recording this, so we're doing Black History. And there's a couple of these that I've seen that I want to check out. Today we're at the Ma Moreau Museum. It says Home of Black Culture in Second Life. So I kind of want to, I'm just going to wander around and check it out like I normally would, right? So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So I found this under um, recently added, which I think might be one of the places that I start looking now for... Oh, this is like an actual museum. I haven't been in here. I don't know if you guys realize I don't actually go in and check out all these places beforehand. Maybe you do. So this is an artifact hunt. Oh, that's fun. And this is on the uh, Forever Tourist. I know we did that back in like September. Um, and then we have some books. I saw this bookstore information. Oh, so you can get all these different books. That's really cool. Nice. I like to read. So that's your core autobiography. Black skin, white mask. That's really cool. Oh, and then these are chairs. So if you wanted to come and read, you could do that. If the books are 500 Lindens each, I don't know. I mean, of course, that's going to be cheaper than if you were to have purchased them in like a bookstore, right? Um, this is a map course for about 1665 showing all of Africa being called Ethiopia. And the Atlantic Ocean was the Ethiopian Ocean. I don't own the original. It was $2,250 15 years ago. I wish I could get this TV to play, but that's probably just a, a black dragon thing. So let's see if we can go. I'd like to go to this one. All right. We're in Z. Oh, okay. And then we can use these to TP around to the different things. Nice. All right. Let's go ahead and get in there. I really like textiles. I don't know why exactly. I mean, like I crochet, but I really enjoy textile stuff. Especially like when you think about it from the perspective of say you're making something with like a wool yarn, you may have raised the sheep, you may have sheared the sheep, you may have colored, dyed the yarn and then spun, well, I guess you spin the yarn, then you dye the yarn, don't you? Spin the fiber. Anyway, like you're completely involved in the process. And these things, I don't think they would have been crocheted. They probably would have been woven or maybe block dyed. I don't know how, clen how Kente cloth is done, but I mean, if traditionally these things took lots of time and they had meaning to it it's not just oh that was a pretty design they had meaning to it and i just i think that's beautiful and then if you look up here saw this it has the uh, andinkra cloth symbols there's a chart here like, i don't know how you would determine or put it together and it has the the Gi Nyame means accept God, to express the omnipotence and supremacy of God in all affairs. I don't know if this is something that would be more modern either, or if this would be like before colonialism. Um, and then what do we have here? We have an Ankh. Um, in the year 1787, upon seeing all of the evidence of Africa in ancient Egypt, or Kemet, uh, Count Constantine de, Vol de Volney wrote, I just think that this race of black men today Oh, just think that this race of black men today are slave and the object of our scorn is a very race to which we owe our art, sciences, and even the use of speech. Okay, let's look at the onk. The onk. Onk symbol, sometimes referred to as the key of life or the key of the Nile, is a representative of eternal life in ancient Egypt. It could also have, been, have a more physical connotation. The onk may represent water, air, and the sun. Oh, water, air, and the sun, uh, which were meant to provide to provide and preserve life in ancient Egyptian culture. This particular Ankh is decorated with the judgment of Mott. Mott was a critical figure in Kemet and Nubia. The symbol of Mott is a black woman with wings. From this image, we get the modern day angel. The black woman, her angelic face and universal wisdom. This is where the phrase, a woman is a measure of a man, because Mott would measure your or weigh your good deeds against your bad and judge your soul. This is where the three major religions get the concept of judgment from the soul by an angel. The laws of Mott were included in this exhibit. Oh, so this would be Mott, Mayette. This is saying Mott also spelled Mayette. Okay. Mott also spelled Mayette. 
in ancient Kemet Egyptian religion, the personification of truth, justice, and the cosmic order, the daughter of the sun god Ra. She was the associate of Thoth, the god of wisdom. Mat stood, oh, she was associated with Thoth, the god of wisdom. Mat stood at the head of the sun god's bark as it traveled through the sky and the underworld. The goddess Mat, Mat is the embodiment of ancient Egyptian seven principles of Mat, which are truth, balance, order, harmony, righteousness, morality, and justice. The ancient Egyptians believed the universe had an order to it, and it was Mat who kept everything in balance. This helped the ancient Egyptians develop a strong sense of morality and justice. Mat was extremely important in achieving the afterlife. This just says, what I abhor is ignorance, smallness of imagination, the eye that sees no further than its own lashes. All things are possible when we all things are possible. When we speak in anger, anger will be our truth. When we speak in love and live by love, truth and love will be our comfort. Who you are is limited only by who you think you are. That's beautiful and true. And true. I don't want to zoom in on the angel. Even like I do want to, but I don't want to for this. Okay, and then over here we have um, Amahotep. Known as uh, Amhotep the fourth, named after the world's first recognized genius, Amhotep, which now means peace in the modern um, era. Uh, oh, Akhenaten is credited for restoring the single belief system to Kemet. Many scholars in Kemet, Egypt at this time mention that people had lost their connection with the older Kemet civilization through roots of belief, morals, and overall views. Many longed for the days of the golden era. Akhenaten was dedicated to restoring the people to their true and original beauty. Later in life, the pharaoh Tut would attempt to discredit Akhenaten's efforts. Tut had the goal of restoring Kemet to its chaotic and unorganized structure to benefit his reign and associated ruling class. This effort by Tut led Kemet, and Kemet Egypt, on a path towards its eventual destruction, sacking and oppression by foreign invaders. Akhenaten's life and that of his queen Nefertiti are infamous. He was one of the first pharaohs to recognize the need for internal changes within the city and the empire versus constant expansion. He was known for his love of peace and his hatred of warfare. Uh, and he moved the um, capital. Moved the capital. There's actually, there's a whole PBS series, not to take away from this at all, there's a whole PBS series called Empires, and there is one about, e there's like a six hour part about Egypt, and it's just super interesting. So I really, if this is a time period that interests you, uh, I would really suggest watching it. It's probably on like Amazon Prime or um, the PBS. I know they have a video.pbs, you can watch it there. Um, we also talk about some obelisks over here. Um, obelisks papered monolithic pillars originally erected in pairs at the entrances of ancient Egyptian temples. The Egyptian obelisk was carved from a single piece of stone, usually red granite from the quarries in Aswan. It was designed to be wider uh, at its square or rectangular base than its pyramid top, which was often carved with an alloy of gold and silver electrum. All four sides of the, the obelisk shaft are embellished with hieroglyphs that characterize characteristically include religious dedications usually to the sun god and commemorations of the rulers while obelisks are known to have been erected as early as the fourth dynasty no examples from that era have survived obelisks of the fifth dynasty sun temples were comparatively squat no more than 10 feet tall the earliest surviving obelisk dating from the reign of Sesostris, that stands at uh, heliopolis a suburb of cairo of cairo a suburb of Cairo, where once stood the Temple of Ra, one of a pair of obelisks erected at Karnak by Tutmos I, is 80 feet, 80 feet high, square at the base with sides 6 feet and a weight of 143 tons. Many obelisks have been looted by grave robbers and thieves. It is a known fact that Rome has at least 20 obelisks stolen from Egypt. Many museums, like the British Museum, have been blasted for keeping stolen artifacts of uh, Egyptian culture instead of returning them to Egypt. They should be returned to Egypt, sorry. 
I mean, we have the internet now. You can... Sorry. I just think it's really crappy that they don't do it. Um, Mott, Judgment Day. So we talked a little bit about Mott a minute ago. Let's keep on that um, same vein. Um, ancient Egypt, Egyptian texts refer to two distinct forms of the judgment of the dead. Oh, that the judge... Ancient Egyptian texts refer to two distinct forms that the judgment of the dead can take. The first sees judgment as a continuous process with the dead being subject to the decisions of a court in much the same way as they were when in much the same way as they were when they were alive. The second sees death as the moment when the whole life of a person is judged with a verdict which has far-reaching consequences of their afterlife. Those found to be pure are declared to be an ankh. Ankh or transfigured spirit, who is Mat Haru, through a voice, while those found wanting face, the feared second death, they might be fed to the terrifying demon Amit or thrown in the lake of fire. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, let's see what this was. Uh, kneeling brother, this approximate date of this, 2900 BC. Upper Egypt, Old Kingdom. This replica statue depicts King Pepe I kneeling and offering new pots, ritual vessels that held milk or wine. A king would a king would kneel only before a god, so this statue must have been placed before the statue of a deity in a temple. This statue is a prime example illustrating that all kings and pharaohs did not see themselves as the sole creator of the universe. Uh, Egyptians have always known who the creator was and their relationship to it. Gods were people that lived and represented the supreme being on the planet. I'm saying Egyptians there because I don't want to read our people. I mean, I guess I could. I don't know. I just don't, you know, I don't want to offend anybody. I have, you know, I used to have a friend from Zimbabwe. And he told me about some, uh, some of the ancient kingdoms in Africa. And so that kind of started me doing, I mean, obviously Zimbabwe is on like complete opposite end of the uh, continent. But... There's so much history and we don't, especially here in America, we don't like listen to it. Like we have our own issues with race, right? But I think that that part of the issue there is how we've um, whitewashed. And I don't know if that's, I feel like that's the right phrase, how we've whitewashed like black history as a whole, not in just black American history, but like black history, global black history. We don't acknowledge it. So, I think it's unfortunate. Um, Dogen masks? Dogen masks? Uh, Mid-century, 1500 to 2000, these are funeral masks. Funerary masks? So, they would be worn to a funeral. And then a fertility totem from West Africa. Akwabe, Akwaba. Or wooden ritual fertility dolls from southern Ghana. Best known are those from the Fonti people, Fonti dolls. Um, other tribes in West Africa region, uh, for example, Kru and Evo people have their own distinctive style of Akwaba. Akwaba and Fonti dolls were known to have been taken to the Americas by some enslaved Africans. They're also known to have been carried by slave mothers as little deities in connection to their ancestral homeland in Africa. I, you know what it is? I love all this stuff. I love his, his, I don't love, like, I love history. I think history is important. That's where I was going. <laughs> um, sailing. Kemet Nubian sailing. Classic area 4000 BC. So long ago. So 4000 BC was, we're in, was like 6,000 years ago. That's like so long ago, right? Uh, Egyptians, Nubians, and other nations throughout the continents of Africa mastered the art and construction of boating. Uh, often there is a focus on small craft. However, we know that there were cargo ships that carried cargo exceeding 10 tons a day on a daily basis, similar to now. Our ancestors have mastered celestial navigation and began expanding our beautiful culture to all other continents. Often the expansion from Africa to the world is viewed as unorganized and a hunt for food. This is illogical. Africa is considered to be the breadbasket of the world. The expansion into other lands was part of the natural expansion of empires and cultures. The origins of all cultures is is rooted in the history of black people. And I, to be honest, I think that's true just because, you know, our, we all came 
from Africa. That's where the first humans were. Um, oh, and then we have this little thing over here. It's going to be the Aztec column from Mesoamerica. So this is 1000 to 1200 AD. Um, the exact origins of the Aztec people are uncertain, but they are believed to have begun as a northern tribe of hunter-gatherers who came whose name came from their homeland, Atzlan, or White Land, in the Aztec language of Nahuatl. Nahuatl. The Aztecs were known as uh, Tenocha, from which their capital city, Tenochtitlan, was derived, or the Mexicana, the original name of the city that would replace Tenochtitlan, as well as the name for the entire country. The Aztecs appeared in Mesoamerica as a southern south I'm sorry. The Aztecs appeared in Mesoamerica as the south central region of pre-Columbian Mexico is known or in the early 13th century. <coughs> Their arrival came just after or perhaps perhaps helped to bring about the fall of the previously dominant Mesoamerican civilization, the Toltecs. And these were the Toltecs, right? Oh, these were the Olmec. So this is just something else that I've never heard of before. I believe you. I believe you. I don't want to call anyone a liar. I just, I have, hadn't heard of it before. So what are we at right now? We're in gallery three. Let's go to exhibit two. I don't, oh, I don't remember which one this was. Oh, this was the uh, science one. So black inventions and innovators through time. It has a list here. Okay, so let me do it this way. It has a list here of uh, a short list of ancient Egyptians' inventions. And then it, over next to it, just like we saw downstairs, it had a list of black inventors. And I believe that both of these changed. Um, yeah. And then over here, we have 17 African men and women. Oh, sorry. 17 African-American men and women have been to space. And so, uh, as of December 2021. Um, yeah, here we go. Here's some photos. How exciting. I would love to go to space. Like, I think that's probably, I don't know. It's pro not like a big regret, but I would love to go to space. That's all I'm saying. Um, yeah, and I think... This is probably true. We often see movies of people in space, but we forget that um, that black folks have gone to space, you know? So it's something that is definitely obtainable. This flag is backwards, but they probably want this one to go this way. They both, anyway. You know, probably no one but me is ever going to say anything about that. And I'm not even being super nitpicky. Uh, Tuskegee Airmen, famous African-American fighter pilots. Um, they were a group of primarily African-American military pilots and airmen who fought in World War II. They formed the, 300, uh, the 332nd Expeditionary Operations Group and the 477th Bombardment Group of the United States Army Air Forces. And then, I don't know if they're, pro they're probably not going to touch on experiments um win a car raffle and then over here we have the uh, first black automaker cr patterson and sons uh, cr patterson's and sons company was a carriage building firm and the first african-american owned automobile manufacturer this company was founded by charles richardson patterson who was born into slavery on april in april 1833 at a, on a plantation in virginia this exhibit was designed and created by Second Life resident and African American Second Life Metaverse automaker uh, Fly P. Toretto. And here we go. There's some photos here. Have y'all ever gone to? I think it's like I don't know if it's like the uh, Library of Congress or what, but they have uh, audio. Rec they've digitalized audio recordings of former enslaved persons um, who were like in the former enslaved Americans who obviously were enslaved in before the Civil War, but like interviews with them and talking about their lives and stuff like that. If you've never listened to them, you should check them out. I, I don't know, I 
think they were very interesting. Okay, so this was two. We want to go ahead and go up to one. I guess I don't hear that voice in the background anymore, so maybe that was just downstairs on the very first one. So this is going to be more um, science and um, Africa and how Africa is changing. Uh, as this says here, is Africa the next European Union? And that's definitely something that would be, that's a possibility. Gambia became the 22nd country to ratify the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Here's some of the trade routes. What is this? Oh, is this like the, um, I don't know why there's really nothing connecting. Is this, but I, th I thought that the desert was like up here, not right here. I don't know. I mean, that's my own problem that I don't know, but and over here, Africa's smartest cities. They, they, Africa does have lots of metropolitan areas. We have Hope City, we have Waterfall. Oh, it's changing. Got all these drones, hot drone spots, it says. That's cool. African monorail. So cool. Space communications. Are they getting a... Um, Oh, rapidly growing broadband networks have become a main infrastructure for personal and business communications powered by cellular and space communications. Africa as a whole is pro uh, positioning itself for the future. Cryptocurrency usage in Africa. And then, of course, minerals uh, and natural resources, which may or may not be renewable. So, you know, I think that it's kind of our duty to be sure that a lot of these places don't get too victimized by destruction of um, of mining and stuff like that. Oh, click the rock and sit to start mining. Current Bitcoin value. Pretty awesome. I think this is an important one too because I think a lot of times when we think about Africa, maybe, I mean, you think about like the bush people and the people living in poor communities and stuff like that you don't think about people living in the big cities in africa and how there are metropolitan areas and there are technological advances it's not all just a big vast emptiness of third worldness you know but if in order for things to get better in some of those poor areas do we absolutely need to invest in them so just me oh uh, let's go ahead and was there anywhere else i don't want to go to any movies we doing that well this was really interesting i thought they had lots of great stuff and lots lots of information i don't know um so i hope that you had like a lot of fun going around and, and learned something checking out these different exhibits here at the moreau museum i had a lot of fun i learned stuff and I really enjoy doing these types of Let's Explore videos, so um, I hope that you enjoyed it too. Please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe if you're inclined to do so, and I'll see you next time.